Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. As we know, October is the month designated to bring awareness about domestic violence. But instead, it's often an issue that hangs in the shadows of other social awareness issues that also claim October. Therefore, I felt it was my responsibility and duty to speak a little louder. I want to share some information that otherwise wouldn't be seen or heard unless you click on a website or attend a domestic violence awareness conference. After surviving a short-term relationship with the sociopath, I clearly understood the importance of saying something sooner than later. True awareness comes from the stories of survivors like you and I. It's our duty to speak up, especially for those who didn't make it to freedom. I hope this video encourages you to be bold and courageous because your voice is important. How do I know? Because abusers use a lot of energy trying to keep you quiet. Before I begin sharing stories of victims who lost their lives and survivors, I want us to take a moment of silence to remember the names of children, women, and men who lost their lives. These are only the names that were reported. I believe it's safe to assume this is only a small fraction of those who died at the hands of their abuser. The first six stories I want to share are stories about those who didn't make it out. I will be their voice for the next few minutes. They deserve to be heard. Please remember their names as I read aloud. Jelia Pridgen, Jadis Pridgen, Harmony Anderson, Nevaeh Pridgen. On Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021 in Muskogee, Oklahoma at 1.30 a.m. There were reports that shots had been fired and police responded to a house in the 900 block of Indiana Street where they saw an armed man. An officer shot at him but missed him. 
and the man fled on foot. After a short pursuit, officers apprehended 25-year-old Jaron Pridgen. The children's mother, who is Jaron's girlfriend, Brittany Anderson, was shot in the head, but was alive along with her son, Cadence, who was also shot. Both were airlifted. Cadence later died at the hospital. Cadence Anderson. Brittany is the lone survivor among her and her children. However, there were three more children in the home who were not injured. Brittany's sister says this. He and Brittany were a great couple and they had a great bond. They had five kids together. They weren't perfect, they argued, all couples argue, but it was never anything bad, she said. This was completely unexpected. There were no signs, no indication that something would happen, especially this. They were a good couple. Jaron, however, was on probation for throwing a piece of cement at a woman in 2019. He pleaded guilty to a felony, assault and battery for that offense. Jaron was charged with six counts of first degree murder, one count of shooting with the intent to kill and one count of possession of a firearm while on probation. Kyra. Jacqueline Franchetti remembers her two-year-old daughter, Kyra's favorite things. Kyra liked to go fast down the slide and she liked Mickey Mouse, Bubbles and Independence. Everything was, I do it, mama, Franchetti says. Franchetti doesn't know what Kyra would like today. That's because in 2016, Kyra was murdered by her father who shot her in the back twice, then doused his home in gasoline and set it on fire, killing himself in a murder-suicide. Kyra would have turned seven this year. I miss her every single second of every day, Franchetti says. When I go to visit her grave, I don't even know what to bring or leave behind. What do seven-year-old girls like? Franchetti did everything legally possible to keep Kyra safe from the day she was born. Franchetti had left the relationship with Kyra's abusive father, but she allowed him to visit her and Kyra in the hospital. He was angry and Jacqueline was so fearful for Kyra's safety that she got out of bed with Kyra in her arms, even though she was recovering from a C-section. When the nurse came to escort Franchetti back into bed, she gave Kyra to the nurse. I said, please take her to the nursery because I was scared of what would happen to her. Franchetti had to threaten to call security before her former partner would leave. Franchetti was served with papers when Kyra was a few weeks old and her case continued in family court until Kyra was murdered. The first time I entered Nassau County Family Court, I thought Kyra would be protected. I quickly learned our courts do not protect the children. They protect the abuser. Kyra's entire life, we were in family court, she says. When you end up in family court, the abuse doesn't stop. A judge, child protective services staff, a forensic evaluator, and a lawyer for Kyra were involved in the case. Still, they couldn't help Kyra. Despite reports of abuse, the forensic evaluator recommended joint custody. He felt that a father should always play a role in a child's life. Well, 
Kyra's father did play a major role in her life. He murdered her, Franchetti says. At the last court hearing, weeks before Kyra was murdered, Franchetti shared more details and reported that she was terrified of her former partner. The judge told her it was not a life or death situation. She was wrong. And now Kyra's gone. Now Franchetti is working to change the system so other children aren't abused, harmed, or killed by a parent like Kyra was. What happened to Kyra is not an isolated incident. Donasia Holloway Epps. On Saturday, May 22nd, 2021, in Walter Burrow, South Carolina, just after 10 p.m., police responded to the 500 building on Forest Circle after receiving a shots fired call. Arriving officers were informed of an unknown subject running from the 300 building. When officers arrived on scene, they say they found a silver sedan with apparent bullet holes. Upon further investigation, they found Donasia Holloway Epps had been fatally shot inside of the sedan. On May 24th, officers with the Walter Burrow Police Department arrested 21-year-old Justin Cole Carroll and charged him with the murder of his ex-girlfriend, Holloway Epps. Even though my daughter did follow all the steps, she did everything right that she was supposed to do, said Shamika Holloway, mother of Donasia. She did everything possible, but he still got to her. She had noticed some things about him, his temper, his attitude with her talking to people, going places, things like that, Shamika added. He was jealous, very jealous. The Holloways said Donasia ended her two-year relationship with Carol, but he continued to contact her. There was another time he called her phone again, talking to her, asking her, where are you at? And he was in her house, playing with her puppy, Shamika recalled. The family said they took steps to protect their daughter. Donasia blocked Carol on social media, changed her phone number several times. She stayed at the Holloway family's house and filed a restraining order against Carol. They even reached out to Carol's family. I stayed there with them an hour one time getting to know him. But like I said, you can only raise a child the best way you can, said Don Holloway. Carol has a violent history dating back to 2016, including charges relating to guns, drugs, domestic violence, and five counts of attempted murder. For the attempted murder charge, he pled guilty to a lesser charge and served only probation. Christina Proden. Christina Proden, age 27, was killed by her ex-boyfriend, Joseph Sean Anthony Porter. On or around January 4th, 2018, although under an active domestic abuse, no contact order issued in December, 2017, Porter was known to stop by Christina's apartment Christina's mother reported her missing to police early morning, January 5th, only 30 minutes after an officer had encountered Christina and Porter near her apartment, where Porter drove away from the scene. When Porter was arrested on January 6th, his face was covered in burns. Police discovered that on January 4th, he beat her and then choked her to death. He then shoved Christina's body in a large suitcase and drove to New Orleans, where he put her body in a junkyard shipping container and burned it, accidentally burning himself in the process. 
Porter has an extensive criminal history with numerous domestic violence charges and no contact order violations. Both Christina and Porter's mothers commented on Porter's history of abuse, stating he had raped and beat Christina and had a history of harming animals. His mother also notified police weeks before Christina's death, saying that he was planning to kidnap Christina, empty her bank accounts and take, take her to a place she would never be found. Porter pleaded guilty and was convicted of second degree unintentional murder, but given a sentence longer than the recommended term due to his hiding Christina's body. Brandon, excuse me, Brandon Jose Niez. Brandon was shot and killed by Marcelino Lopez in South St. Paul on April 2nd. Prior to the shooting on April 2nd, 2020, Lopez posted threatening social media messages, including threats to kill directed at Brandon after he began dating Lopez's ex-girlfriend. The social media exchanges escalated and Lopez and Brandon met with the intention to fight. When Brandon arrived at the location, he and a 16-year-old friend exited his vehicle. Lopez then took a shotgun from his car and shot the unarmed Brandon and 16-year-old before fleeing. He later called 911 and stated he had shot two people. When police arrived, Brandon was dead. The 16-year-old was transported to a hospital with a gunshot wound to the chest, where he remained in critical condition. Lopez was arrested and told police he had made several death threats to Brandon before April 2nd. Marcelino Lopez has been charged with second-degree murder of Brandon Jose Niez and second degree attempted murder and first degree assault for shooting the 16 year old boy. David Reese, age 58, was found dead from multiple gunshot wounds on March 23rd, 2020 in his Blooming Prairie home. Police began to suspect David's wife, Louise Ann Reese age 56, after she forged over $10,000 in checks in her husband's name the following day. Unable to locate Louise in the state of Minnesota, authorities searched around the country and received a report from acquaintances in Florida that she was in the state on April 5th. While in Florida on April 9th, she killed and robbed a 59-year-old woman to steal her identity. 10 days later, on April 19th, Louise Reese was apprehended by officers on South Padre Island, Texas, after a restaurant host recognized her from media coverage. She was then extradited to Florida and has been charged with first degree murder with a firearm, grand theft of a motor vehicle, and grand theft and criminal use of personal identification information of a deceased individual. The Dodge County Sheriff's Office has stated they are investigating Louise for killing her husband. Although she has not yet been charged for his murder, second degree charges are expected to be brought against her. Now I would like to share the stories of those who made it out and understood the importance of speaking up. These folks knew their silence could hurt others and themselves, so they exposed their perpetrators. Delshawn, she emailed an encouraging snippet of her story, and I want to publicly thank her very much for her bravery and courage. These are her words. Your story matters to God, you matter. Set yourself free. Set your kids free. 
God set me free, I was emotionally, mentally, and physically, and sexually abused by my ex-husband and beat until I was unconscious at times. One day I woke up cold, beaten unconscious in a tub of water and I wondered how I got there. He had beat me so badly with the belt that my skin felt like it was on fire at times. My ex-husband said multiple times that he was sorry and that he loved me and that he would change. After being in the tub, he said, this is just our marriage. I will abuse you and I could kill you. He had no remorse. Eventually I decided to leave with absolutely nothing to my name. I only had the clothes on my back and a jar of change that equaled 80 dollars. With starting over, I am now free. I have a new job, a new apartment, a new life. I'm fixing my credit and I plan to buy a home soon. It's been two years and God is good. It was hard, but I'm here to tell you that you can do it. I currently work, work two jobs sometimes, and I will not give up. God is my strength, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I got the strength from God to testify against him. He spent 19 months in prison. I only wanted God's justice. I'm here to ask you to leave, even if there seems like no justice will be served. God sees all things. Elizabeth, his behavior changed rapidly. I know I should have recognized it, but when you're inside a situation, it's hard to get perspective. One day, my daughter called me crying, saying my ex had threatened to hit her in the head with a hammer. I called the police and they removed him from the house and I got a restraining order the next day. After a month, I went to the judge and asked him to rescind the order because I couldn't imagine this man hurting us. Then on January 13th, my whole life changed. When my ex entered the house, my daughter was awake. I heard an argument. I came into the living room area to try and calm her down. Her eyes were wide with fear. She could see him approaching with a gun. When I turned around, shots rang. I managed to dial 911. I couldn't talk because my face was shot up, but they traced the call to my home. The police came, then the medical team. I heard a policeman say, oh, this is just a domestic violence case. He was just five feet from where I was fighting for my life and where my child lay dead. There was nothing just about it. My entire face was reconstructed because the bullets tore it apart. I was in a coma for almost a month. When I woke up, I was hit with the reality of the situation. My brother and sister refused to bury my daughter without me. I had to go to therapy to learn to use my muscles, but a lot of it they couldn't fix. I can't blow my nose. My lips are still numb. And when I'm eating and drinking, I don't know if something is too hot until I get a blister. It's been a struggle. I've talked to women who dated my ex and they've mentioned he was violent with them. Had I known he'd been abusive with other women, I wouldn't have made him a part of my life. The first time somebody asked me to talk about what happened, it was hard. It's hard every time. But if it changes one life, it matters to me. Domestic violence is such a personal issue and it's a secret. We must get people to understand that they're not in it by themselves. 
I've met young women and men who've heard my story and said it changed them. It gives them the courage to reach out and ask for help. Tommy Wassenberg. His story as a victim of abuse began with a familiar male misconception. I can be her savior. That was what he thought when he first met the woman who would become his girlfriend. She told him about how she had in the past experienced violence. She told him about how she had been beaten in a previous relationship. She spoke about how unhappy she had become. Tommy was deeply moved. He hoped to help her and to prove to her that not all men are the same, that they can be caring and considerate. The idea that all she said was just one big show designed to win my trust, to instrumentalize me, Weissenberg recalls, was something that simply didn't occur to him at the time. It was the beginning of a desperately painful six year long relationship. Weissenberg is a confident man. He is built like a tree, tall and sturdy. He's a guy who likes to get things done. He tells his story in a calm and measured tone. Tommy, a victim, many would find it hard to imagine, but beware of those cliches that suggest that a victim must be small, soft, and weak, especially if the victim is a man. Tommy and his girlfriend moved in together. He supported her, both emotionally and financially. He remembers it as a rewarding relationship and as they grew closer, they didn't just share an apartment, but also a bank account and their day-to-day -day routines. Soon they were almost completely dependent on each other. And then things took a turn for the worse. It first began when we were on holiday. We booked ourselves into a hotel that didn't meet my girlfriend's expectations and she refused to pay the bill. Weissenberg remembers, she wanted me to back her up, wanted me to tell the hotel manager that this place was a dump, but I refused, feeling ashamed to be doing him down. Instead, I went ahead and got into the car and left her to do her own thing. And when she got into the car, she started to slap me around the head and screamed at me. So I thought, that's not going to happen again that I refused to stand by her. His girlfriend tried to justify her outburst by telling him about her troubled childhood, a childhood without love or affection, without stability, and he bought it. As the years went by, the emotional dependency grew. I felt like a servant who always had to get everything right. Tommy remembers, he says it was his top priority to please his girlfriend and follow all her rules. There are rules for everything in their day-to-day -day lives. Which piece of fruit to choose, how to pluck it, how to serve it. And if it didn't please her, then it was bam, a blow to the head. It was always the same thing. Get it right and please her or there will be trouble. But it was never good enough. His partner's wishes became more extreme, the violence too. Eventually, Weissenberg ended up in the emergency ward with cuts and broken bones. Still, he didn't defend himself, didn't hit back. For many years, he hoped that she would see the error of her ways. I was a bundle of nerves trying to function to meet her expectations not to repeat my mistakes. There was no time to feel lonely or reflect on my situation. As the years went by, it seemed less and less likely that help would come from outside. His girlfriend controlled all his social contacts. The couple began to avoid anybody who might suspect what was going on, including family members. Angela. In my case, it started as verbal abuse. I'd known my partner for 20 years and he was a good person. He started changing in 2015 after his mom died. He bought several guns, including a machete and a shotgun. He became more combative 
not only with me, but with others and through his social media. I couldn't do anything right. One evening in early November, it turned physical. We were having a conversation and at some point it escalated and I asked him to leave. I walked over to the door, opened it and said, we could have the conversation another day. He grabbed me by the hood of my sweatshirt, threw me out my door and got on top of me and started choking me. I managed to yell for our oldest son and he got off of me and left. We'd broken up, but we were starting to work things out again when one morning we had a disagreement. I was in the bathtub when he came in and shot me. I can only remember the last two gunshots. I'd look up at him and he says, look what you made me do, Angie. You made me shoot you. He returned with my cell phone and I told him to dial 911. I felt as though I was dying. My legs felt prickly. I didn't realize he had shot me in the back and I was already paralyzed. I can remember being loaded into the paramedic's truck and saying to the female paramedic, please don't let me die. I have four children to raise. I spent three weeks in the hospital. During that time, around 400 people came to visit me. That's when I realized I had a message I wanted to share. Since then, I've been doing a lot of public speaking, not just about gun violence and domestic violence, but about gun control and mental health. If people are willing to listen, I wanna talk about the things that matter. I survived nine gunshots, but I've never cried about being paralyzed. I still have pity parties, but it's because I have to rely on others when all I want is to be a mother again. This year, I will be partnering, partnering with the, the Iris Domestic Violence Center where I will be talking to people about what to do if you're experiencing an abusive relationship. Let's not just point people in the right direction, let's walk with them.